resisting the privatization of public space. So we are now <clears throat> starting our, our day two. We had a wonderful session last night. Hannah has just arrived. And <clears throat> very, uh, what Puerto Ricans call a revolu, there was a lot of revolu, a lot of uh, excitement with the kind of dialogue, and we're looking forward to a, a wonderful day. You have the pleasure of taking it off for us. You have <coughs> Dennis, who has been spending a couple of years with us now with the Social Justice Initiative here at PIC. So without further ado, I'm going to let you present yours, and then Moises Gonzalez will then present, and then we'll have time um, if there's some dialogue and conversation. Thank you, Thank you much. Thanks everyone for heading out here this morning. Let me just jump into it because you know I tried to cut it and condense it, but it's still a little bit long. So, resisting the privatization of public space. The origin myth of the birth of modern cities due to the expansion of trade and the rise of the mercantile class during the age of empire is common, even if not part of our popular language. What has filtered through to popular discourse in this just so story is the idea that cities are unique in bringing heterogeneous people together. As a melting pot, cultural mosaic, or salad bowl, this idea of that city as a space of engagement with others across difference remains fundamental to our image and imagination of the modern city. For Louis Wirth, one of the founding members of the Chicago School of Urban Sociology, what distinguished the modern city was its density and economic specialization. Wirth popularized the vision of the city as a machine, with each person akin to a unique cog or part that works in concert with others to create a functioning apparatus. Even if the metaphor of the city as a machine has lost traction, Wirth helps me to think about how urbanism necessarily entails an extreme degree of interrelation between people and dependency on others. Another sociologist, Max Weber, also tackled the origin of the modern city. In his writings, Weber emphasized that cities did bring people together, but that this was not by choice. He notes that for medieval lords, cities represented new opportunities to exploit their serfs and bondsmen as artisans or small merchants. Weber reminds that it took serfs coming together in solidarity and association through guilds to fight for their freedom. Freedom was hard won, and there was much blood spilled to achieve this right to freedom. Sovereignty from feudal bonds was fought for, and these struggles eventually coalesced and congealed into the legal status of citizenship. As Weber puts it, quote, the principle appeared, city air makes man free, end quote. The idea of the modern city as a democratic space for people to engage each other across difference of the modern city and freedom, economic, political, personal, etc., has become fused together in our popular imagination. From its inception, for the idea and ideal of cities as blenders spinning people from all walks of life together, the street or the public plaza has been the image of democratic interaction. Keeping in mind Wirth and Weber, in this articulation, it is this articulation between democratic politics and public space that I want to look at today. Before doing that, I want to note that this is going to largely focus on North American paint with a very wide brush, um, something that's going to generalize and very much flatten out particular differences in a way that generally I'd be uncomfortable with, but I want to do it in, in a way to kind of raise some set of questions that I find important. It's easy enough to point to the gap that exists between the ideal of the modern city as a space of democratic encounters and the divisive reality of politics and public space in our contemporary cities. But there are other reasons to return to the origin story of the modern city into birth and Weber. One question concerns the difference between struggling with others for rights of citizenship and having these rights granted or ascribed as the basis of a kind of legal inheritance. As the fight for marriage equality in this country reminds, rights expand through historical struggles. Yet, as legal rights have increased, and not just for those mobilized, broader inclusion has meant people feel they're entitled to rights, such as free speech, assembly, liberty, and freedom of religion. When rights are historical given rather than actively fought for, what does this mean for politics, people, and public space? For politics, the first thing to point out is that we conceive, what we conceive of as rights of citizenship and freedom differ from those that Weber describes. Today, as anthropologist James Holston and our unit of Powderite point out, liberal notions of rights bearing citizenship, quote, do not presuppose or promote any substantive conception of the good. Rather, they are supposed to enable citizens to pursue their own ends consistent with a similar liberty for all." End quote. The freedom that Weber's medieval citizens fought for was the freedom to associate and, by coming together, to collectively shape particular conceptions of the good life. In our contemporary cities, the right to association is sacrosanct, yet the drive impelling a sense of freedom towards what geographer David Harvey describes as, quote, a neoliberal ethic of intense progressive individualism and its cognate of political withdrawal of support for collective forms of action. 
Despite necessary interrelation and interdependence on other people in urban space, the result is an individualistic logic of disaggregation, one where the imagination of the common good resides in the freedom of everyone to pursue their own private interests. If liberal notions of community are under siege, the image of the city as a fundamental space of interaction continues to color contemporary political imaginations. The discourse of public space articulates people and place together. In doing so, the plazas, parks, streets, and other open spaces of the city come to stand in or become a proxy for an imagined public or publics. Yet, though these spaces provide room for the creation of a public, in and of itself this does not make these spaces collective places or sites for the democratic interaction of people across difference. Echoing Weber's words, as architect Susana Torres notes, quote, the public realm neither resides nor can be represented by buildings and spaces, but rather is summoned into existence by social actions." End quote. A democratic political public and public space needs to be produced. These are the results of an engagement with others that enables a collective to emerge, and in doing so activates the political possibilities of space. Drawing a line from Weber's research to the example of the contemporary city, it seems to me that the articulation between public space and democratic politics needs to be and is only actualized through struggle. Take the Occupy Wall Street movement, for example, which looked to exercise their right to assemble, to free speech, and to public space by taking over a city plaza. Ironically, participants could not surround the charging bull in Bowling Green Park as was first intended because the police shut that plaza down. They were able to take Sukkari Park because it is private property and the police had no cause to deny access to protesters or to a victim without the owner say so. This points to how the entanglement between public space and democratic politics is a necessary fiction. It also calls into question not only who the public is in public space, but also where and whether any public space exists at all. If the public's and political possibilities of public space are produced through social usage, and here I recall Hannah's um, Orange Dwarf protest from yesterday, what happens if the material landscape, the very grounds for this articulation, has been privatized or rendered the exclusive domain of particular users? We know, for example, that more cities are undertaking urban renewal in public-private partnerships that produce spaces such as Sukkati Park. How does this redefine the relationship between democratic publics and public space? In New York, for example, the private-public Union Square Partnership uses quality of life issues such as crime and concern for property values to effectively police access and use of Union Square Park. Here and elsewhere, in the name of the public good, private guards, security cameras, and a host of regulations ensure that the homeless are evicted, that graffiti is quickly painted over, and that the normative public is one of shoppers at the arts and crafts and farmers market. Though not literally fenced off, what does it mean that we maintain the discourse of public space in sites where access is effectively curtailed? As anthropologist Marina Peterson points out, the right to use or be in privatized public space is always revocable for those who are deemed to be their permissible users, or what she calls permittees. It follows from Foucault's notion of governmentality and the panopticon that, as permittee users, we all participate in the production of privatized public space through acceptance, enactment, and enforcement of limits on, of our own and others' activities, behavior, discourse, demeanor, dress, etc. Under surveillance by video cameras, by security guards, and by each other, we police ourselves and also others. This limits not only the extent of who the permissible public is in public space, but also its political possibilities. We imagine public space to be a critical feature of democracy and our plazas and streets as critical stages for democratic participation, be it expressions of free speech and assembly. Yet, in the United States, as Peterson notes, quote, the relation between public space and protest is figured through legal arrangements that sanction dissent by controlling its expression, allowing it to take place in particular times and spaces with permission from and under the watchful eye of the state, end quote. Free speech in the United States is highly curtailed and corralled. Expressing dissent has been possible largely under, only under the watchful and sanctioned eye of the state, often the same state that one is protesting. Scheduled and sanctioned, these formal expressions of dissent generate fleeting spaces in the transitory politics of protest, covered as spectacles by the media, but quickly forgotten as the streets and plazas return to their daily use as sites of consumption or transportation from home to work and back again. The privatization and regulation of public space through public-private partnerships and the formal nature of permissible protest transforms the political possibilities of a site's sociality and spatiality. Though common, these are not the only dynamics foreclosing democratic political participation and open access to public space. In the city of Oaxaca in southern Mexico, for example, the Central Plaza has been a critical site for political participation by mobilized groups looking to make their grievances and demands known to the state governor. However, in 2005, under a tourism and culture for development campaign, 
State Governor Ulises Ruiz Ortiz decided to transform the offices of the governor's palace into a museum and to move the governing bureaucracy out of the central plaza to the outskirts of the city. Critics pointed out that this move was a political decision having to do with removing the government from the immediate proximity of social protesters. The government's evacuation most certainly did transform the political dynamics for groups such as Oaxaca's Teachers Union that have taken over the plaza every year for the past three decades in order to force the government to attend to its demands. Yet it strikes me that the transformation of the political space into a museum by a tourism for culture and development campaign is equally important and part of a broader dynamic privatizing public space. Since Oaxaca's city center was named a World Heritage Site in 1987, city elites and government functionaries have not only cultivated and policed its colonial image, but also generously profited from it through their control of tourism and open development. This has given form to a particular architectural morphology, two-story, traditional, colonial, colorful. This has also framed a particular vision of the place of everyday Oaxacans within its social landscape. Folkloric, traditional, a cultural attraction to complement the black and green pottery, the wooden figurines, woven rugs, archaeological sites, and regional cuisine that the state is known for. Oaxaca's cultural heritage, material and human, has become commercialized for consumption by an industry catering to foreign eyes and for foreign incomes. Again, I think this parallels a lot of what we heard in more detail yesterday with regard to the branding of Fort Slav. With restaurants, hotels, and shops in the center affordable only to city elites and tourists, the commercialization of the city and of culture has left many Oaxacans feeling that their, tr their traditions and identity are exploited for the benefit and enjoyment of the wealthy elite. In Oaxaca's commercialized spatiality, tourism and economic development have hollowed out practices of political protest from the city center. Whether in the public spaces of New York or Oaxaca, the only permissible public hailed by privatized and commercialized city spaces is the consumer public. The gaze of police, video monitors, and each other ensures that, rather than instantiate a political sociality, we actualize a consumptive spatiality whose slogan might be, no politics, just purchase, please. Constantly under surveillance in public space, Peterson suggests that, quote, the camera reflects a wider social control insofar as the choice and effort to present oneself as invisible to the cameras constitutes the moment of force, end quote. Assembling to engage in political practices of protest ensures that people render themselves visible. And of course, for most black and brown bodies, whether in a street corner in Chicago, at a plaza in Oaxaca, or even shopping at Barney's, invisibility is not just a luxury, but often an impossibility. Though the image of public space is one of democratic interactions across difference, the reality of the narrow limits of permissible publics and politics means that a general suspicion marks any and all others encountered in our commun communal city spaces. Despite the radical interrelation of urban dwellers, in the last century, the idea of meaningful democratic interaction across difference was replaced by the hope for, more toler for mere tolerance for differences. But, but in our cities of walls where we retreat to homogenous enclaves and live hidden behind personal fortresses, today even this has eroded and been replaced by a general fear of difference. In public and private spaces, the institutionalization of fear has meant a turn to community as security. The result is that, as sociologist Simon Bauman has written, quote, Community means sameness, where sameness means the absence of the other, especially a stubbornly different other, end quote. Whether Oaxaca or Oakland, the electrified wires and 12-foot fences surrounding wealthy homes and the dirt roads and social stigma that form moats around poor areas and poor populations create zones of exclusion. Any facile notion of connectivity across a space of flows is interrupted by the archipelago-like spatiality and sociality of urban life in the contemporary city. The effect is that we live in segregated societies whose spatial and social exclusion is secured through militarization and radical differences in consumerist possibilities. <coughs> As urbanist Teresa Caldera notes, disjunctive democracy is the contemporary norm rather than the exception. Given an incessant discourse and focus on vulnerability from crime, moreover, the general response has been to call for greater security measures and tougher punishments on those deemed criminals, who many people say and think of, of, of as having too many rights. However, although Caldera recognizes the vast gap in the articulation between public space and democratic practice, she and many others insist that the ideal matters because it legitimates struggle, impelling people to strive to fulfill its inclusive promise. Yet I want to end by suggesting that practices of struggle do articulate public space and politics, though perhaps in ways that challenge common conceptions of democratic politics as the fulfillment of this inclusive promise of public space. Rather than see public space as an open stage for public interactions leading to convivial discourse among strangers, this entails listening to Weber's exhortation to remember the blood that has seeped in the city stones from previous struggles. It means paying attention to the violence of urban renewal projects and selective commemorations of the past, and we heard about some of those yesterday, 
that whitewash struggle, that erase or bury histories of mobilization, packaging the present solely for consumption, often through the active marginalization of people, place, past, and alternative futures. The failed repression of a teacher strike and disaffection with the authoritarian politics of Oaxaca's governor led to a social movement in 2006 that mobilized over a million people in a state with three and a half million residents. This mobilization resulted in a massive encampment in the city center, mega marches throughout the city, nightly barricades, participatory assemblies, and a robust art of protest that denounced the state's repressive politics and deep injustices. Placed in public spaces throughout the city, the art of protest challenged the criminalization of protest in the limited spaces for free speech in the forcibly muted political landscape of Oaxaca. Democratic rhetoric focuses on public space in the public sphere, sites open for debate that welcome difference. Yet artists and participants in Oaxaca's social movement needed to take over the streets to make their voice heard. And when they did so, they were regularly met with police repression. Media coverage of events allowed people also to see how profoundly the government and corporations controlled the means of communication in the public sphere. The walls of this World Heritage Site became the largest community mural in Latin America in the six months that the social movement controlled the city center in 2006. A broad cross-section of society participated in the creation of this collective mural. This made the city's walls an important site for the public projection of discontents and wishes for alternative futures. At a basic level, stencils played on city walls resisted the privatization of public space and attempted to constitute the streets of the city as spaces of debate. More importantly, this interventionist public space certainly reminded the oppressed members of Oaxacan society a long history of everyday suffering. These images point to the systemic nature of marginalization. Yet they also speak to people's courage in mobilizing to find a solution. The art of protest on city walls denounced the authoritarian politics of the government and problems of economic injustice, patriarchy, and racism. The images invited people to reflect upon the conditions in which the majority of Oaxacan and Mexican people live. They also narrated the changes of people's thinking that the social movement brought about. People found their sentiments and thoughts reflected in the images, their problems, demands, desires, and hopeful aspirations. Given the diversity of participants and perspectives in this, as in any social movement, the images revealed shared points of identification. In a heightened moment of danger, protest practices produced a shared and visceral sense of togetherness that created new social networks and a community in struggle across the city that came to identify themselves as el pueblo, or the people. Through their message, iconography, and the sheer fact that they were present in the streets and in Oaxacan's minds for some time now, El Pueblo has both come to identify with these images and to become identified by them. For some, putting up stencils on city streets is a transgressive act, for others, a criminal one. It is both a transgressive and criminal act because it is a clandestine practice that places an image that does not seek to sell a product and does not pay for public space. In doing so, stencils question the ways in which discourses about the democratic nature of public space that's the reality and practice of the exclusionary, policed, and privatized character of public space in modern cities. This art also challenges the dominant consumerist and capitalist paradigm that largely determines that what is seen in the public sphere is that which is intended to incite the consumption of goods, and that in fact defines the consumption of goods as the good life. Street art and street artists are reclaiming people's right to define alternative visions of the good life. Oaxaca's art of protest took a creative stance against the privatization of public spaces, the colonizing of desire, and the commercialization of culture. Stencils placed on the street constituted important political acts, not only because these were acts of defiance, but precisely because they were acts of creation. The fertile power of Oaxaca's art of protest involved much more than the trick of pulling back the curtain on the Wizard of Oz to expose the nefarious workings of power. Though critical, its radical power went even further than putting forward an alternative vision for society. The most radical and creative aspect lay in the way in, in which the collective practices of Oaxaca's art of protest made new social and political relations possible. What you saw in the streets aside from advertising prior to the social movement was almost exclusively graffiti. Most was composed by the tags of youth looking to demarcate their urban territory. The majority of people could not read these, and so their public was limited to other street crews and youths in general. Graffiti was looked at with disdain as unreadable scribbles made by disaffected and vagrant gangs of young people. The social movement pushed these chavos banda, as they were called, to develop a newfound sense of political participation. The social movement radicalized youths in the graffiti scene. Incited to write their stories and points of view on the walls through stencils, the chavos banda reworked their image as pot smokers and thieves. From an image of vagrants and vagabonds involved in petty turf wars, through their street art, youths earned and won the mobilized people's respect. This goes a long way in explaining how mothers who would ordinarily have called the police upon seeing street kids with spray cans outside their doors came out in 2006 not only to encourage them, but even to join them. In 2006, the Oaxacan state militarized the streets and people mobilized. 
This mobilization manifested itself in the making and maintaining of barricades, participatory assemblies, collective marches of hundreds of thousands, the takeover of state-owned media, and the art of protest. The political public of El Pueblo that the social movement articulated through these practices was built on a growing sense, sense of connection and points of intersection between individuals who were no longer abstract to one another. As I say, you know, a factory worker who imagines his or her interest in relation to all the workers of the factory or to the proletariat class as a whole. El Pueblo is the ground of community constituted by practices of struggle that construct shared social experiences and imaginaries. El Pueblo is also a particular political public in contested public space. As philosopher Jacques Rancière has written, quote, there are two major ways of symbolizing the community. One represents it as the sum of its parts, the other defines it as a division of its whole. One conceives it as the accomplishment of a common way of being, the other as a polemic over the common, end quote. Rather than suturing or papering over differences or divisions, here politics involves the tearing open of society to expose its open historical wounds. It involves making space for political confrontation and active contestation, where mobilized individuals come to find that, as Holston and Apaderai propose, quote, right becomes conceived of as an aspect of social relatedness rather than as an inherent and natural property of individuals, end quote. The power and political possibility of social struggle resisting the privatization of public space and democratic participation is not in creating consensus or a political public, but rather in making space for the radical participation of everyone in active confrontation over the very nature of community and of the good life. Thus, rather than exercise rights to free speech in public space, demanding attention from the state for a particular grievance, and then confirmation of rights through law, people transform their social space and realize real change in relation to each other through social mobilization in Oaxaca. Thank you very much. Thank you.